Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the September, can't believe it, September Government Affairs Committee for the Cocoa Beach Regional Chamber of Commerce. My name is Jennifer Sugarman. For the next week and a half, anyways, I am still the President and CEO of the Chamber. Very happy to be here. Thanks for joining us. And I also have with us our chair for this year, Ashley Wood, and our co-chair, Caitlin Lewis, is also on from Port Canaveral. Ashley, do you want to say hello and say a few words? And yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, just, I can't believe this is our last meeting with Jen. You will be missed. You've been a big help to me, I know, chairing this. Um, so it will be definitely different next year <laughs> or next month. So I just want to say a few things for the end of the year. So next month we are working on um, our agenda. And then in November, we are planning on doing a legislative uh kind of see what we want to present to the uh, legislature next year. Session does start in January. Um, and we'll also kind of start doing a layout of who we'd like for speakers for 2022. Can't believe I'm saying that. Um, so that is a very important meeting. Not a lot of people like to attend because it's kind of boring, but it is very important, it's our voice uh, for the chamber. So I encourage as many people to attend the November meeting as they as possible. So I think that's all I have for now. So I'm gonna pass it back to you, Jen. Thanks, Ashley. You guys are gonna be fine and we'll make sure you're set up before I go. And what could possibly be boring about laws being made in Tallahassee that could impact your business? Everyone should show up to that meeting. That's the first Friday in November. So please do that, help Ashley and Caitlin out and our executive committee team, because if you're not at the table, we don't know what issues you want us to carry your voice through to Tallahassee. So please make sure you're there. Speaking of voices that we like to carry for, um, it's no secret that in Cocoa Beach, we have a, a huge amount of hotels and hoteliers. One of those powerhouses in Cocoa Beach is Mr. Tom Hermanson. Yeah, I said powerhouse. Tom Hermanson, who is with Ocean Partners, and um, he's got a great group of hotels, and certainly we're no stranger to Tom Williamson, Williamson being around in these meetings. And um, again, just appreciate you allowing us to do this. <clears throat> this morning, it's always great to see you, and um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you to share your screen, and hopefully everything will get started. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'll try to be brief as I can. Uh, I tend to get a little long-winded, especially when I'm talking about hotels and lodging. <clears throat> can everybody you, see much? You can have a lot of time because we're, we're running ahead, so you're good. I can see your screen. Everybody can see my screen. I'm getting nuts. All right. Uh, let's kick it off. So Space Coast Lodging Update. Uh, we are a... Uh, local group of hotel owners, operators, uh, principally now in two partnerships. Uh, first is Ocean Partners Hospitality that owns and operates the Marriott Courtyard in Cocoa Beach, the Hampton, the Best Western, and the Days Inn. And then in the last few years, have formed another um, partnership called <clears throat> Cape Hospitality, which opened up the Spring Hill Suites last July, uh, kind of right in the middle of <laughs> the worst part of the pandemic. And we have another town place suites next to it uh, under construction that should open up in July of August of next year. Um, if you're not familiar with it, these two properties are on the north side of the Radisson, just as you come into Cape Canaveral off of uh, from the north. Uh, I'd like to give a little primer for people that aren't familiar with the acronyms of uh, of hospitality. Uh, we have sort of three primary measures that we look at. Uh, obviously, one is occupancy, and we call occupancy expense. You know, the more people that you have in your hotel, the more staff you need and the more supplies you need. You've got average daily rate, which is you know, the average of, of what those customers are paying. Um, but the real metric that we look at in comparing hotels and, and profitability, which are actual top line reflects, is called revenue uh, RevPAR, which is <clears throat> revenue per available room. So whenever you talk to hoteliers, you'll hear them use these acronyms um, pretty regularly. So you've got occupancy times ADR equals REVPAR. Uh, lodging supply and the analysis of comparative uh, performance in, in, in lodging both locally and uh, across the nation is really uh, controlled by or um, 
developed by a company called Smith Travel Research that about 80% of hotels nationally report their top line data to Smith Travel Research that then aggregates all that data to allow you to compare how your hotel performs compared to a competitive set or um, markets like Brevard County or Cocoa Beach to other uh, cities and towns. Uh, what Smith Travel Research does not collect is Airbnb and vacation rental by owner, VRBOs, which has over the last 10 years just become a tremendous force in hospitality. And it's something that's often overlooked um, by a lot of people that don't uh, look at that data. So we, they ha we have started collecting obviously data from them. There's a lot of third party providers that provide insight into that market. Um, but to really understand what's going on in lodging in Cocoa Beach all the way you know, through nationally and in major metropolitan areas, you really have to have an appreciation for the tremendous growth that that market um, um, provides as far as supply in lodging. And uh, it really has become a, uh, a huge factor in, in lodging overall. So, most questions that I get, you know, over the last year is how bad did it get? So I've taken for uh, just to show you sort of specifically in Cocoa Beach, the day that I have obviously historically is the four hotels that we've had for over 20 years, um, the Ocean Partners hotels and aggregated or average those four numbers. <clears throat> you can see here occupancy ADR and red par going through 2019. 2019 was our high watermark, best year we'd, we'd ever had. We'd had strong growth through 15, 16, 17, 18, and then the 19. Um, I remember having conversations sort of at the end of 19 and, and just being really surprised at how well things were going with my partner, Tom Williamson, and wondering how long it could last and you know what a downturn <laughs> might look like. <laughs> And uh, little did we know, we were facing, uh, you know, the worst downturn in short-term downturn in lodging uh, in, you know, you could argue probably a uh, hundred years. So uh, you can see we hit the absolute low in rev par here at ten dollars <throat> revenue per um, per occupied room, uh, or I'm sorry, revenue per uh, available room in April of uh, 2020. At, $9.97 uh, compared to rev par of April 2019 of $127. And we obviously struggled through there uh, with over probably a 60% reduction in top line revenue through the balance of 2020. And uh, we're still, you know, really under obviously performing horribly in uh, January and February. Uh, March even of 2021 started off slow and then all of a sudden there was a, a an explosion in demand kind of through the second half of March relative to what we had been doing caught everybody off guard uh, which played into the labor shortages and supply shortages and everything else so it was you know really challenging obviously operating at dramatically reduced revenue levels through 2020 uh, and it's been even more challenging trying to get back up on plane here with so many people that are having, leave, having left hospitality industry <clears throat> in the last few months. We're finally starting to get a little reprieve here. Um, it's both good and bad now in August where things have really slowed down again. But you can see here in, in July, uh, last on this slide, we hit a, a rev par of $137, which actually exceeded 2019 of $133. So signs for hope and, and a recovery. Uh, here I've aggregated for the last four years occupancy on a trailing 12 month basis. Uh, there's a lot of noise and a lot of seasonality in month to month numbers and hospitality. So it's you know, difficult to look at those charts on a multi-year basis. So what we do is we you know, just run a tra trailing 12 months and you can see here, uh, and if you look at data on a 12, trailing 12 month basis, you can see you know, it's relatively consistent you know, up through uh, March of 2020 there. You know, numbers don't move all that much on a, on, a, on a year average basis. And to see this kind of a drop in occupancy really sort of puts it in sort of clear sight how, how bad it was. It just sort of got bad and just 
stayed bad for a long time. I've got um, our four Cocoa Beach hotels here on the chart. And then the black line is Brevard County's average that uh, takes into account probably 60% of the hotels in Brevard County. Our drop reflected, uh, you know, the overall drop in the county. Some observations here, the, the hotels catering to crews and corporate demand, which is the green line and the blue line on top, uh, saw a larger drop in occupancy and uh, beach going sort of less expensive uh, beachfront hotels catering more to transient travelers like the Best Western and the Days Inn didn't see as uh, big a fall in occupancy, but you can see the overall market fell in, in a similar fashion. Uh, the second you know, thing is obviously ADR. Uh, you know, we had pretty dramatic falls in ADR, but not as much in occupancy. Uh, it is, uh, that was really the big fear is uh, obviously nobody's, you know, talking about rates and you price your hotels compared to your competitors. And fortunately, it could have been a lot worse, but fortunately, hoteliers here in Brevard uh, didn't uh, just cut rates like they did in, hotel in Orlando and other major markets where they have much uh, greater swings in, in average daily rate based on the overall supply, based on that drop in demand. So rates, while they fell here pretty dramatically, didn't drop as precipitously as occupancy, which uh, allowed us to maintain uh, some rate stability. Uh, you can see them sort of starting to pick up here. Uh, unfortunately, with rates, they're obviously, uh, like with many things, a lot easier or a lot faster to drop. and and much more challenging to, uh, to bring back up because of the sort of inelasticity on, you know, on the upside as opposed to on the downside <clears throat> when people, when hoteliers get desperate. Combining those two uh, criteria, you see the drop in Revpar. And uh, you know, we're seeing fairly good pickup here. This little orange line on the right is our Spring Hill Suites. Only have two months of trailing 12 month data. Um, that you know, hotel is kind of still just out of its first year and is still uh, waiting to be discovered. Obviously, we would have hoped to have started in a stronger year because that's a great product, Marriott product, and normally would have come up on plane a lot faster. It was a really challenging year to open a hotel. So we have a red par drop of about 55%. Uh, so that's a top line reduction at the Hampton the Courtyard, about 45 and 50 at the days of the Best Western. To sort of see how that impacted profitability, we were only uh, able to reduce our operating expenses, <clears throat> labor being the largest portion of that at about 20% of revenues normally uh, by about 35%. And our income fell between 70 and 80, you know, in certain months, uh, you know, 90, 95%. So that's how you know, this is a pretty good depiction or, or a precise depiction on how Cocoa Beach, uh, which is pretty reflective, as you can see here in the Brevard County line of, on, on how hotels did. The uh, Cocoa Beach and Hampton Inn had further to fall and fell further, uh, the courtyard and the Hampton Inn and Cocoa Beach and uh, the Best Western and the Days Inn being lower rated hotels maintained uh, slightly better. This slide here is a uh, sheet from Smith Travel Research Report. Uh, anybody can find this report in the Tourist Development Council's monthly agenda packages. And what it shows is Brevard County and the submarkets in Brevard County and how we compare to a subset of markets that we compare ourselves to other drive markets, uh, leisure markets in Florida. And uh, I've shown you the Revpar here highlighted uh, year to date Revpar in 2021 compared to 2020. And you can see Brevard County's Revpar increased by 19.6% in that uh, seven month period compared to 2020, which sounds good on the face of it until you see Jacksonville Beach there has increased their Revpar by 68%, Clearwater at 67, Daytona at 63. West Palm, you know, has not done as well as those three markets, but still they're up 
Orlando, you know, is the only sub market that or market that we compare ourselves to that we're outperforming. But so we're really underperforming our competitive markets and uh, the reasons that we can attribute those to. We believe, you know, don't have exact numbers on this, but we know one thing, one of our prime demand generators for a large subset of our hotels in, in the county is obviously cruise demand. We didn't have an appreciation truly uh, historically as to how important cruising was to our market. Uh, obviously we run hundreds of thousands of people through our hotels and some people we know are going on cruises and others we don't, you know, they just kind of come and stay and get in their cars and go to the terminals and go on their cruise. So uh, it became painfully obvious when cruising seized uh, that it was a much larger percentage of our market than we thought. And, you know, we thought that our average hotels probably did 20 to 25% cruise demand. And that cruise demand probably is 30 to 35%, depending on the time of the year. Obviously cruising is cyclical like, uh, uh, like tourism in general. Uh, we also saw in the last few years a pretty dramatic increase in supply, uh, both hotel supply as well as Airbnb supply in Brevard County, which uh, obviously in a downturn with that more many rooms, uh, you're going to see a larger drop in, in, in occupancies as well as average daily rates. And I'll speak more about sort of that supply growth here in a second. <clears throat> uh, here you see the hotels uh, that were developed through the sort of latter part of 17 through 2021. Um, we added 1,540 rooms. Uh, that is on a current total of uh, 10,603 hotel rooms in Brevard County, constituting 106 hotels. That's the overall supply in Brevard County. So that's a pretty, it's around a 17% growth in that area. And we went for many years, you know, probably 10 years prior to that, we didn't add that many rooms. So, you know, my partners, Tom and Bob and our other partners were sort of lamented that we've, we were discovered all of a sudden. And uh, I probably get three or four phone calls a week from brokers uh, wanting to either buy hotels or, you know, looking for land to build hotels on. Um, obviously the Brevard County story is very compelling and uh, we were ignored for many years uh, as far as lodging is concerned and now everybody's figured out the dynamics that make us a pretty unique market with our multiple demand generators of transient travel to the beach, uh, all the activity up at KSC and the fact that we are next to the second busiest cruise terminal in the world as well as the growth in the Orlando market. Uh, there's probably another thousand rooms in the planning phase here. Uh, I think the majority of which will get developed over the next couple of years. Uh, you can see here at the bottom of the list uh, is our town place suites that we should be opening, uh, like I said, in July, August next year. And uh, we got five other hotels here on, on the list that are currently under construction. Uh, going to the supply in, in lodging uh, through uh, Airbnb and VRBO, these are obviously private residences that, uh, you know, lease themselves out. The whole notion that uh, Airbnb is somebody running on a couch in their living room has always been a fallacy. Uh, these are, you know, entire single family residences or condos or apartments that are rented out. There's currently 2,400 active listings. And uh, the average, as I'll show you here in a second, is about 2.2 rooms. And so that's really 4,800 room nights uh, or, or hotel, hotel rooms. Probably if you go 2.2, you know, it's over 5,000 hotel rooms. So we've had a market, you know, that saw dramatic growth here in the last few years, adding 17% in supply, but at the same time, we're seeing compound annual growth rate in Airbnb supply of over 10% per year, year in and year out. And so Airbnb uh, rooms in, in individual single family residences almost reflects, you know, close to 50%, 45% of our overall hotel supply. Uh, the TDC and the Brevard County Tax Collector, uh, we negotiated in the last few years to 
for those entities to actually collect the bed tax. They didn't for years. Uh, Airbnb is a just a powerhouse lobbying organization and they funnel God knows how many millions of dollars into Tallahassee and every other capital in the country. And uh, while we lobby uh, with gusto and are known in Tallahassee, we just have no way of competing with those organizations, which is why the restrictions on those uh, or the preemption of restrictions on renting um, those uh, types of properties and markets and that property rights argument versus of I have a right to rent my property versus I live next door to one of these properties and I have a right to quiet enjoyment. I would say uh, being pretty familiar with the issue is one that, you know, if you have a VRBO or an Airbnb next to you is, is, a, is a losing battle. Um, the only way that's gonna change is, I don't see it changing unless people actually specifically get elected to Tallahassee on that issue and start adding additional restrictions. Otherwise, we're gonna to continue to see growth in this market because it does provide income to people that buy houses. And I know personally people you know, that own 10 houses plus in Cocoa Beach that they've bought up recently in the last few years only for BRB, Airbnb rentals. Uh, the caveat to that uh, that I should add out and, and I've highlighted in green here is while hotel rooms are all available unless you're out of service uh, 365 days a year, Airbnbs are not. Uh, so it's you know not really reflective. It's not apples and apples when you say 4,800 Airbnb rooms compared to 10,600 hotel rooms because people don't have their Airbnbs on the market all the time, but it's still a large, a very large supply that continues to grow year over year. A little reflection of uh, this is uh, this data is readily available on a website called airdna.co. Here you can see all the current listings of Airbnbs in Cocoa Beach. It's got 10,065 Airbnb listings. That's 44% of the Airbnb listings available in Brevard County. And you can see the growth rate here. They have 12% <laughs> quarterly growth rate. Uh, since 2018, which if you understand compounding is just a, a tremendous growth. Uh, if you add Cape Canaveral into that, you've got another 549 active listings there, 27% of the total listings in Brevard, and they had 10% quarterly growth. So you've got 1,600 or 1,555 listings in Cocoa Beach and Cape Canaveral only. and I look at that data and, you know, the average hotel in Cocoa Beach is around 150 rooms. Um, that's essentially 10 hotels that have been added to Cocoa Beach and Cape Canaveral in 10 years, uh, you know, without but three hotels coming out of the ground. So we've added in that time frame four hotels in Cocoa Beach, but we've added the equivalent of 13 hotels in supply through this growth in, in Airbnbs. You see here, this data gets a little blended. You should point out that Airbnb, some, you know, 40, uh, 30% are listed on both. So you have to take that into account when you look at the, uh, the overall supply. Uh, nationally, uh, as far as uh, growth is concerned or the recovery, sort of looking uh, out further afield, uh, you can see this is uh, information put out by CBRE. Uh, here you can see that, uh, you know, the recovery here in the last um, couple of months has stagnated. Um, we can only attribute that to uh, travel hesitancy, uh, the Delta variant. Uh, we're seeing it in our own hotels. Things have really slowed down here in the last couple of weeks, three weeks since school came back in. This is historically, you know, a, a slower time of year, October, September. I mean, uh, end of August into September and October. But uh, as far as the recovery is concerned, year over year, uh, you can see here at the right end of this chart that things have slowed down. Uh, really hoping that, you know, the more people get vaccinated, uh, you know, they'll continue to travel. But if this Delta variant continues to rampage at the rate that it's going, uh, um, we're obviously concerned that the recovery is going to be slower and longer 
um, <clears throat> both nationally and locally here. The big impact for us is obviously cruising, which is under a microscope. Um, it drives me crazy when I see a, you know, a New York Times headline when they talk about a cruise ship that has one, you know, one or two cases of COVID on a ship of several thousand people. But, you know, my daughter going to church camp where 55 out of 70 kids come home with COVID and give it to all of Merritt Island doesn't even make the local press. So that's a, you know, that's a business concern for us. You know, cruising has obviously been hit the hardest out of any industry in uh, the nation or in the world with respect to restrictions. And, you know, globally, it doesn't impact uh, <clears throat> many people. Uh, not a lot of people have sympathy for cruise lines. A lot of them, you know, have offshore ships and hire foreign workers, but it's important to note that cruising, the cruise industry has a seven billion dollar a year economic impact to Central Florida alone, and I think it's around ten billion dollars to South Florida. Um, they hire, uh, I think it's close to three hundred thousand American workers work in the cruise industry. So the recovery of that industry is critical, not only to Brevard County and Central Florida, but to you know many many people and. Uh, uh, I'm not going to get into DeSantis's, you know, ban on on uh, vaccine passports for that industry, but you can probably guess how I feel about that. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the uh, sort of most interesting slides that I look at, and I get this report monthly from CBRE, and it's pretty astonishing. And this is sort of the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, between the stimulus and people not traveling last year, the chart on the left, you see household deposits, you know, which bumped along there for better part of five years at just north of a trillion dollars. Well, during the downturn between stimulus and people not moving around and not spending money, that household savings has gone to $3 trillion, which is just absolutely, you know, which is just a staggering number if you think about the, uh, in order to move the needle that much on such a large data set, household savings. So uh, that is a lot of pent up demand, which is obviously, as we can see, driving pricing for everything from housing to, you know, not yet so much services, but primarily goods in the last year. But obviously the economists are seeing a shift from people transferring from, uh, capital goods consumption into services consumption. So that pent up wall up there, household savings uh, should bode well for hospitality going forward. Chart on the right shows you a rebound in consumer confidence here since the beginning of 2021. Uh, obviously people started feeling better in March uh, and with stimulus money in their pockets started traveling uh, with gusto, uh, at least relative to what they had done in the previous year. Um, but obviously, consumer confidence is uh, impacted by a multitude of things. And one of the primary driving forces now, I think, with respect to travel is concern about the Delta variant. For us locally, it certainly doesn't help that we're in the headlines daily uh, as an outlier with, uh, you know, one of the highest positivity rates of COVID in the nation and a legislature and a governor who are while I give them credit for doing a good job through the pandemic of mitigating uh, closures and safety, you know, we're now sort of on the other side of that where uh, with respect to consumer confidence in, in Florida and travelers from around, you know, the nation, not yet internationally, but from around the nation coming to Florida, um, that could have an impact on lodging here locally. But I think we'll get obviously this too shall pass, and uh, and you know we'll again sort of see an uptick. Uh, last slide here. Uh, so this is uh, corporate demand. Uh, this is Google searches, which is a you know a great indicator of uh, you know people making plans to travel, and uh, you see the improvement since January in Google searches for corporate demand on the left and it changed since 2019. And you can actually see that uh, January and February of 2020 over here on the left, which were the high uh, watermark, 
in corporate brands average uh, searches, we started, we almost, you know, we exceeded that peak in July, which is, you know, exactly what we saw in our, in our four local hotels. So, it, you know, it pairs with global searches and global interest or, or domestic interest in travel from the corporate customer. Uh, this is uh, a, an index of sort of leisure travel demand search, um, which also shows a similar improvement in, in interest in travel. So uh, that pretty much concludes. I will summarize by saying uh, the downturn uh, was pretty brutal. Uh, it was a tough industry to be in uh, personally and for my partners. We're obviously looking <laughs> seriously at our concentration in this business and, and, and looking at other businesses because I don't want to, uh, we're obviously quite concentrated in hospitality. Uh, the stimulus spending and uh, the PPP allowed uh, small businesses like ours, you know, with 200 employees to, to survive. Frankly, uh, the PPP allowed us to maintain our employee base largely, even though we, we did suffer some layoffs, just there was no demand for so many months and uh, the PPP and how long it would last was uncertain. Uh, Brevard County demand will normalize when cruising comes back. Uh, you know, I think most people miss the fact that yes, there are cruise ships cruising, uh, but Disney normally travels, you know, normally cruises at 120% occupancy or 110 to 20% occupancy. They judge occupancy by 100% <clears throat> is the beds that you kind of see on the floor in the room. And the additional occupancy that they can squeeze on their ship is those bunks that come down from the wall. And, you know, Disney sells normally, you know, four ships out of Port Canaveral at 100% year in and year out or 100 plus percent. And these cruise ships are now going out in 30, 40%. So until they can normalize how they cruise and how they manage through COVID, hopefully with fully vaccinated staff and passengers, it's going to take a while before we get back to pre-pandemic levels in cruising. <clears throat> All that said, I don't mean to sound uh, uh, pessimistic. I'm obviously very bullish on, uh, on lodging and in Brevard County in general. Uh, we've got growth opportunities at the port that the other ports uh, that we compete with, Miami and Fort Lauderdale, don't have. Uh, we will soon, someday, be the largest cruise uh, port in the world. We've got Kennedy Space Center and all the amazing activity going on there, and uh, not least of uh, which is going to drive future demand for lodging in Cocoa Beach and in and, and, and Brevard County General is and the future growth in, in Orlando. It's one of the far fastest growing metropolitan areas in, in the United States. And as I mentioned before, that record personal savings rates is going to get unleashed here uh, uh, on the US. And if it's, you know, favors services and travel and experiences, which people uh, went without during the pandemic, that should bode well for lodging, <clears throat> both in Brevard County and nationally overall. So that concludes the presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, Tom. Awesome presentation. I love how data heavy it was. That's going to be great for sharing. So thanks for putting that together. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, then oh. And uh, let everybody, I, I failed to do self introductions in the beginning because I hadn't had my coffee yet. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go one by one. And if you could say your name and who you're with, your title, and then if you have a question for Tom, now would be the time to ask it. So again, really appreciate your presentation, Tom. Thank you so much. I have um, Cheryl Clark with us from my team from the chamber. You want to say hello? Morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, Liz, you're next. Morning. Great presentation, Tom. Good to see you. Um, Liz Allward, Assistant City Manager for the great city of Satellite Beach. Okay, Jim Underwood, you are next. Uh, good morning, Tom. Good morning, everybody. Great presentation. Thank you so much. I'm representing the Cape Canaveral Lighthouse Foundation. Awesome. Thanks for being here this morning. Deanna. Good morning. Cocoa Beach. Chamber Ambassador Tom, that was very informative. Thank you so much. My pleasure. 
Thanks, Deanna. Our fearless leader, about to be for real, for real fearless leader, Jim Barfield. <laughs> yeah, Jim Barfield, um, Lucan Associates and Chamber Chair. Tom, um, that was a great presentation. It seems like I've seen this stuff before too, I think. Uh, and it didn't have too many typos. I thought it was pretty good. Hmm, but, uh, typos. <laughs> Thanks. I do have a question for you, Tom, though. Um, with all the new uh, new hotels coming in, all additional rooms, and uh, plus coming off the pandemic, also an issue with affordable housing, how bad do you think the labor market will be for your industry? It has been uh, the biggest challenge for us and, you know, reflective of what you read. Um, I I'm, I'm can't you know it's painful to go into, but it, it is it is exceedingly challenging to to get people to come and work in hospitality. I read a uh, a frightening survey that was done by the University of Chicago last month, where they surveyed several thousand hospitality workers that were laid off during the pandemic, and fully 32 percent said they weren't planning to not go back to hospitality due to low wages, uh, difficult work conditions, and frankly, how they are treated in their jobs by the customers. Yep. Uh, those were the three prime criteria. And, uh, and that's something we should kind of all think about. So we have on our end, on our starting wages and the bulk of our hourly wages have to raise our, our payroll by about 20% from pre-pandemic levels. And we're paying incentives and doing everything under the sun. We always consider ourselves an employer of choice and, and had a really stable labor force, relatively speaking. But it's become exceedingly challenging, not only to find people to do the job, but also to keep them. Uh, we've just had tremendous turnover where we'll offer, you know, five people will accept a job and less than 20%, you know, one in five might last 90 days. Uh, obviously, you know, a lot of the restaurant tours here in town and, you know, you guys know that some of the restaurants are closed two and three days a week, sometimes just for lack of, of employees to run those restaurants. So it is a real challenge and it's going to be a real challenge in hospitality. Uh, uh, it's just been a dynamic shift that those were, you know, the largest number of jobs that were lost during the pandemic. And I think psychologically, there's just been a kind of a shift, everybody woke up and smelled the coffee and kind of looked at the world differently through this pandemic. And I think that challenge in getting people back into hospitality as a, as a job and as a career is gonna to continue to be challenging for a long time based on this sort of mindset, uh, shift in mindset. So it is, I, I'm not sure what we're gonna do. We talk about it with my partners all the time. Uh, you know, addition, obviously higher pay, uh, additional incentives, uh, uh, more flexible work weeks, uh, fixed schedules. We have a very cyclical business. Uh, and one of the uh, challenges that people in hospitality face is the instability of knowing how many weeks they're going to, how many days a week they're going to work, how many hours a week, and what their paycheck is going to be a week to week. That's one of the biggest challenges for hospitality workers because sometimes, you know, one week they'll work 50 hours and another week as things slow down, they might, you know, get 20 hours because of the cyclicality from month to month. So we're looking at, it's going to increase our cost by keeping people on and having them do things when the work, the customers aren't there for them, but that is probably going to be the cost of doing business uh, for us going forward. We're looking at childcare. I'm looking at, you know, my partner, Bob Bacher and I are looking for land in Cape Canaveral to actually build apartments for, uh, for hospitality workers, where if we can provide them housing and childcare, then we can get more loyal customers. So we're thinking about everything in order to be able to get a stable employee base uh, in order to operate these hotels going forward. Great idea, good good solution, putting your thinking cap on there. And as long as you can smell the coffee, that's test number one, Tom, so that's good. Um, Cindy Drapeski, you're next. Oh, Cindy Drapeski, owner of Intercoastal Insurance. Um, Tom, um, great presentation, loved all the data, and um, you're just absolutely brilliant. Um, so I, I, I think the hospitality industry uh, here will come back with um, you and your partners, uh, so. Great presentation. Thanks, Cindy. 
Deborah Carson. Hi, good morning. Um, Deborah Carson, Community Outreach for the Office of Steve Phelps with Edward Jones Investments. Um, Tom, this was awesome. So um, not only, you know, what you do for the Space Coast, but um, for your community and the legacy that your family has left here. And um, it's it's wonderful to see you in action for the first time. <laughs> so. Thanks, Deborah. Alan Durr. Morning. I'm Ellender with the Pampered Chef, the kitchen store that comes to your door. And thank you so much for that great information this morning. Thanks, Alan. Don Riley. Don Riley, Riley Hotel Advisors. I, I, it was a great presentation, Tom, and, and it's good to see the industry coming back. And I, like you, was encouraged by the fact that this time the industry did, realized we couldn't buy occupancy and, and just tank rates and lead the race to the bottom because that's what's always happened in the past. Right, Melinda. Good morning, uh, Melinda Kretschmer, representing St. Francis Reflections for Community Engagement Coordinator. And um, I really appreciate the data on this um, presentation. It was really well presented and, um, and easily um, able to follow with your, expo your expertise and information that you provided. Thank you so much. Thanks, Melinda. Nathan Maloon. Good morning, Nathan Maloon with Wiener and Malik. Thank you for the, the very great presentation. I've done kind of a, a good bit of traveling over the past year and it's been interesting to see the different hotels in the different states I've been to and their kind of occupancy levels versus what the data show here. So thank you very much. Thanks, Nathan. Gabriella? Gabriella? Sorry if I mispronounced it. <laughs> thank you so very much. Yes, this is Gabriella Ford representing the Space Coast uh, chapter of SCORE. I'm a business mentor. Thank you so much. It's my first uh, showing here in this meeting. I appreciate it and good luck in the recovering of the hotel business. Thank, thank you. you. We love SCORE. Keep coming back. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. You're welcome. Lena Graves. Hi everyone, Lena Graves here. Um, I am the uh, crazy person in Brevard County who but a zoo. We are the new owners of Romelia Farms, formerly known as Obloy Family Ranch, and uh, therefore a lot of work to do, but uh, we are officially a nonprofit. Tom, that was extremely informative as a new business owner uh, that is obviously welcoming uh, the it, people that are traveling into our county. Um, all of that information is extremely helpful and great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Lena, I'd have done the same thing. Still have slots. <laughs> Yes, we do. We do. And hopefully soon uh, we'll have babies. Oh, see <laughs> I, <you know>. soon. <laughs> I will see you soon. All right. Uh, Maddie McDonald. <laughs> ah, thank you. Um, Maddie McDonald with City of Rockledge Community Redevelopment. Um, Tom, thank you. That was very interesting. And it's nice to see the correlation, the correlation between um, how they work and the uh, Airbnbs. Thank you. Thanks, Maddie. Dixie, are you still on with us? I am. Good morning. Um, uh, Tom, I can only uh, reiterate and uh, ditto everything everyone has said about you and your presentation. Uh, you laid it out in the most concise and clear an understandable way I've ever seen or heard truly. And the emphasis on the work that needs to be done in Tallahassee um, overall, particularly uh, regarding the um, Airbnb style rentals and the impact that's having on our community is just absolutely critical. Uh, putting on the, the lighthouse uh, hat, foundation hat, would really like to give our thanks again to the TDC and to you for your support uh, the TDC grant a few years ago made it very possible for us to partner with the state and get uh, the first uh, replica building off the ground. And we look forward to an opportunity to have you out to the lighthouse where we can give you a tour and anybody else too. You know, please let us know. Uh, and again, thank you for all you and your group do for Brevard County. Thank you, Dixie. All right, uh, Caitlin Lewis, would you like to go next? Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, as Jen said, I am the new co-chair 
of the GAC uh, committee. I am also from Port Canaveral. I do government relations for them. And I could not echo more uh, what Tom said and how the cruise industry is just not impacting Port Canaveral, but the surrounding community and the region of Central Florida. So great presentation, Tom. Uh, we appreciate it. Thanks, Caitlin. Kelly Goldie. Hi, good morning. Uh, Kelly Goldie, Community Bank of the South. Thanks, Tom, very much for the presentation. Um, I wanted to echo what Don mentioned about the uh, price discipline hoteliers exhibited in the recent um, 18 to 24 months. Um, we did see that tremendous race to the bottom back in the 08 recession, and um, that crippled especially a lot of local and smaller hotels. And uh, I, it seems like it was probably um, helped quite a bit. Your slide comparing the deposits to consumer confidence shows that uh, a lot of excess cash for spending allowed probably uh, was one big factor in allowing hoteliers to maintain um, price levels um, in spite of the drops in occupancy. But uh, I have two questions. They're kind of related to the vacation rental market. Um, I, I was wondering if you can read the tea leaves about what the legislature may do in uh, the next session that they didn't do this session. And uh, also, since Airbnb and VROB and others are now contributing a significant portion of the um, hotel tax. Um, I wonder if they're going to start to want to weigh in on the spending of those funds, especially locally. If you have any thoughts on that, I'm glad uh, to hear. Uh, on to the first, as I said, I'm somewhat jaded. I've been going to Tallahassee on that issue and others that impact lodging for 12 years. And uh, I'll tell a quick funny story. There, there is a, there's Cocoa Beach Towers, which is near our uh, Best Western in Cocoa Beach, that is CO'd and uh, uh, CO'd and, and essentially taxed as a single, you know, family resident condominium community. And 100% uh, of the 105 units in that development have short-term rental licenses. And this is, this goes back probably 10 years. And so the Florida Building Code and the Florida Fire Code, NFIP more specifically says that if a multi-unit building of more than four units is leased out, more than 50% of the units on a regular basis or, or puts itself out to lease. It's considered a public lodging establishment and has much stricter fire life safety codes than a single family resident building. And the logic behind that is when you have transient travelers, they're not familiar with their surroundings or where the emergency ingress and egresses are. So you have to have a, a much higher standard. Uh, our hotels are inspected on a quarterly basis by the BR uh, the Bus Department of Business Professional Regulations, and you know we have to go through all sorts of you know, it's 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 a tremendous amount, and and for good reason that you have secure hotels and public lodging. So, the local fire marshal uh, Mark Amaral at the time was very concerned about the growth in these transient rentals and how these residential multi-story structures were being essentially operated as hotels without any of the safety requirements and took it all the way to where we had a videotape uh, with stenographer presentation by the Florida uh, fire marshal. Very impressive gentleman with tremendous regalia and a really cool uniform, looked like a general. And, and also uh, for that discussion, which happened in the city of Cocoa Beach City Hall, uh, was the head of the uh, division of condominiums in, in, uh, uh, in Cocoa Beach. And one specifically asked a question by me, said, I asked the fire marshal, the state fire marshal, when it comes to public life safety in multi-unit public lodging establishments, like specifically this building that is 100% rented on a short-term basis, do your requirements to protect the public safety supersede the condominium associations uh, regulations in Florida, which effectively have a rule that say, and I'm getting a little off topic here, but it speaks to the bigger picture uh, of, of property rights and, and how we do things in Florida. Do your fire life safety requirements to protect the public in dangerous situations supersede, or are they superseded by the condominiums association's ability to, by a majority vote of their board, vote to not implement those same public safety requirements that hotels are required? 
And he stood up on the record and said, their condominium rules supersede my requirements to protect the public. And that was for me the beginning of saying, you know, this is a fight that I'm not going to win. And that then snowballed into, and we met with the attorneys for the DBPR and everything else. And then came Airbnb along and I've watched this progression. And I've mentioned the money that they spend in Tallahassee. And while we live in, you know, the most imperfect democracy in the world, we all know that money plays a large uh, 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 role in politics at every level. And, and you see it year in and year out where the legislators individually play this game where you know, some legislators because of the communities that they live in might push restrictions. Others will push you know, more preemption to the state and you know, year in and year out, you, know, you can call the score. The preemption uh, sort of votes and the leadership will always favor the interests of these Airbnbs. And I believe it comes down to money. The argument, which personally, I'm not going to opine on the right of you to utilize your personal property for profit, I'm a property rights guy through and through, is an actual American right. But competing against that is the, is the right of individuals to quiet enjoyment in residential neighborhoods. You didn't buy a hotel, house next to a hotel, you bought a house in a neighborhood. And so where those two competing forces will end up, I predict that they will end up favoring uh, the ability to continue to rent out, but you know I'm wrong 50% of the time. Uh, I, I went on, this is such a <laughs> topic that I talk about so much. I spoke too long and I forgot your second question. Could you repeat it? Sure, it had to do with, uh, since the um, vacation rentals are now contributing a significant oh, dollar amount to the local you know, uh, tax. Yeah, so they're now representing, because we weren't collecting before, it's 30% of bed taxes are collected and it's a pass-through. You know, Airbnb isn't collecting, while I'm currently the chair of the TDC and work very closely and always have at the TDC because I'm one of the biggest collectors in the county of TDC tax, you know, we're essentially taking the tax from the customer and remitting it to the county. Uh, so philosophically, it's not Airbnb's money, nor is it my money. I'm just collecting it from the customer and giving it to the TDC to use. Uh, do I think Airbnb will weigh in on the minutia of how Brevard County spends its paltry $15 million in TDC money? No. Uh, they would have to uh, get with a county commissioner and get appointed to the TDC and Airbnb is too busy making you know, billions of dollars. You may see you know, association representatives, people that represent Airbnb uh, owners in Brevard County uh, get more organized and, and try to get seats on the TDC and or get elected to office. Um, but as far as those companies getting involved in our local politics, I don't see that ever happening. Thank you very much for those answers. That's important information. Um, Samantha Salonen, you're next. Hi, uh, my name is Samantha Salona and I'm with Lockheed Martin Government Relations. And I wanted to thank you again for the presentation. And I had a question looking forward. Do you see the Bright Line uh, train in, um, impacting uh, the, the occupancy rate? And do you think that would be a new market for We lost. <clears throat> I lost you at the end of the second question. Do you believe the, uh, the, the new train would help um, with occupancy and with labor because um, using the train to go to and from work from Orlando, Kissimmee, all of that? <clears throat> well, uh, I think Brightline is a great project. I actually, as a just a resident, went and spoke on their behalf. I know it's a contentious issue with uh, the number of trains that are planned to go through, but like I said, I'm a personal property rights person through and through, and that is a private company building on their private land. And uh, I think it, uh, as a nation, we can't get behind public transportation paid for by private funds, albeit with the help of some tax um, free bonds. Uh, you know, we're not moving in the right direction. Uh, currently, there's no stop, as you know, uh, planned for COCO. Uh, although there may be in the future. So I think for the time being, we're gonna see those shiny new trains 
pass by Brevard County on their way from West Palm Beach to Orlando. And so it's not going to, I don't think, uh, have any uh, positive impact on, on lodging demand in our area nor uh, uh, labor levels since they're gonna be catering to uh, you know, visitors to the state as opposed to workers. Uh, our, our supply base here is local. And uh, although we do have employees that do, you know, we shuttle sometimes employees uh, using contractors from Orlando when we're really desperate uh, I'm not sure Brightline will impact the overall label, lab, labor market here, even when we get a station in Coco. Thank you very much. much. All right, last person. We've lost some along the way due to their next meetings, but Josh Jensen, I have you last on my list. Josh, are you there? You're unmuted, but I'm not sure your microphone's working. Okay, if you have a question, type it into the chat as I wrap up. Sorry about that, not sure your mic's not coming through. Um, anyways, thank you again, Tom. And I um, just wanted to put a plug into, we just recently had a joint board outing with the Titusville Chamber at the port and we had Captain Murray come and speak to us and he was, mentioning some of the interesting uh, creative ways the cruise industry is getting around uh, not being able to have that vaccine passport. And then a lot of it's being driven by the Bahamas saying that if you're 12 and older, you know, or really just in general, you have to um, have a vaccine and proof of it to sail into their waters. And so that's one way I think the cruise industry is clinging to that. And then um, you just had a lot of other comments for us and our board members about ways they're being creative. So we'll see how that pans out, but we do, uh, we're all pulling for you in the hotels. And if there's anything we can do, especially as we move into October and November and we're crafting the chamber's legislative agenda, that would be very helpful for Ashley and Caitlin and our whole team. If uh, you wouldn't mind sending us your thoughts, we obviously have a lot of them here recorded, but um, we'll keep those in mind as we craft our agenda, but please, uh, you know, anything else we can do as a chamber, just let us know. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time and uh, yep, it's nice to meet everybody. You got Bye. it. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Everyone have a great Friday, a great long weekend. Um, I will still be around. Don't worry. Everyone's calling me panicked. Um, I will be down in Melbourne and North of Grumman, um, but I'll still be around and joining the chamber as Jennifer Sugarman. So I'm very excited to remain involved. And um, Ashley, anything else as we wrap up? No, just thank you. And I hope everyone has a great weekend. Okay, awesome. We'll see you guys at the next one. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.